evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Hey y'all, hey y'all, hey y'all. Come on in, come on in. Come on in, y'all, come on in. to get on. We're going to get started in just a second here. Give everyone a minute to get on here. We're going to get started in just a second. We're going to get started in just a second here. We're going to get started in just a second. If you don't mind sharing this, please share this as you come on. What's up, little bro? How you doing down there, man? How y'all holding up down there in North Carolina? I'm going to give everyone a chance to get on here. Um, as you come on, if you don't mind, uh, let me know where you're watching from, where you're streaming from, where you're coming from, uh, what city and state. Um, let me turn this down a little bit. Um, let me know where you're streaming from, where you're watching from. First, I want to say good evening to everyone. This is your boy, Pastor Q. Um, good, man. I'm glad you guys are doing well. I've been see catching some of the posts and some of the videos that you've been putting up. I'm glad you all are. Uh, Y'all, that's my little brother, uh, Pastor Kanan Greer, down in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, what's up, Dougie, my cousin? Um, he He's a church planter in North Carolina. That's my new little brother. Uh, and he's doing a great work there. And uh, we're praying for you guys. Uh, I know that we're all in this thing together. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about tonight is, um, you know, we normally have our Tuesday Bible study uh, here at New Hope in Chicago, uh, but I want to kind of talk about um, what this moment, what this hour means for the church, and I, I kind of chose as a topic, the church goes viral. Uh, but before I, want, before I get into that, um, I just want to first say, how's everybody doing? Listen, I wanted to kind of check in. I pray that you all are well, wherever you're uh, watching from, wherever you're connecting from. I pray that you all are well. I pray that you all are at peace. Um, I pray that we are not living in a place of fear. Um, we will get through this moment, this hour. We have to use wisdom. We have to be wise in this hour, but we will get through this moment. Um, this is not the first time that we found ourselves in challenged situations and positions. We have not seen anything like this particular situation before, but I believe that the same God who's gotten us through everything else will get us through this as well. And so uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what this hour means and how we conduct ourselves. In the book of Acts chapter 8, uh, the Bible says in Acts 8 verses 3 through 8 that um, Saul, before he was Paul, Saul was persecuting the church and um, they had killed Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church. After they killed Stephen, the Bible says in verse 3, he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. I want to kind of focus on that. Yes, be cautious and cognizant. Yes, it is important that we are cautious and cognizant in this season. Uh, it's also here in Illinois Election Day. And so uh, I pray that everyone has had the opportunity to get out and vote um, and has done that polls have closed by now. Uh, but it is also Election Day, so let's make sure that we're praying and uh, doing our civic duty in that way. Um, in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, 
there's a key thing that the Bible says here. Verse 4, Acts 8 says, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the church goes viral. Uh, listen, there has been a lot of talk over the past week, a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue about the ability of the church. Uh, and I don't mean just our local body, but the church universal, the body of Christ, about the ability of the church to go vi to go viral, to stream, to have virtual meetings, Bible study, worship services. There's been a lot of conversation about how we use technology in this hour where our ability to meet in person can be inhibited and limited, at least for a space of time, for a season. And so it is important in this time that we kind of revisit history. Let me just say this as we start off. Um, a church is not about a building. The church is not about a building. The church has never been and never will be about a building. The church in the Bible the, the word for the church in the Bible is the ecclesia, which means the called out ones. The church is the people. It is not the building. Now, the Bible does say forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And I'm not here to make a theological argument on what that means and how that looks and how frequently you do it. Throughout history, it has meant different things at different times and it has looked differently. However, what it does mean is that the body of Christ, we the people of God, have to be more concerned about people than we are about buildings and budgets. Let me say that one more time. We have to be more concerned about people than about buildings and budgets. Being concerned about people means a few different things. It means that we look out for the well-being of people. And so in many cases, canceling church or not having a physical worship service in a particular building at a moment is not about have, lacking faith. It is about looking out for the well-being of people. Now, I've, I've seen some pastors get on and say that, you know, if you cancel church, you're being a punk, you're being a wimp and all that, and you don't have faith. I'm not here to make an argument about that. Uh, for those who choose to have to gather in person, God bless you. For those who choose to not gather in person and gather virtually, God bless you. But at the end of the day, either way, either thing you choose to do, let's make sure our focus is about people. Because Jesus died for people. God is concerned about people. God's ultimate heart and concern is about the lives of people and people's lives being touched, changed and impacted by the power of Jesus Christ and by the, by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So God is ultimately concerned about people. But in Acts 8, the church, the early church was in a unique position. Now, I'm not saying that the church is going through persecution right now. But what I am saying is we are in a defining moment. The body of Christ is in a defining moment. We're in a unique situation. We're in an unusual season where we are faced with challenges that we've never been faced before. Previous generations have not had to deal with some of the challenges that we have to deal with right now uh, as a body of Christ. And, and so the early church had certain challenges. What was the challenge the early church had? The challenge that the early church had was they were viewed as a cult. They were viewed as weird. They were viewed as crazy. And they were under persecution. Hear me and hear me good. Throughout history... The church has experienced seasons and moments of persecution. So, and, and I don't consider what the church is going through right now persecution. Um, I, we, read, we read persecution in the history of the church. Now, there are parts of the world where the church is under persecution. There are, there are places in the world, parts of Asia, particularly I know that in China, there was a major persecution of Christians. A lot of pastors were actually put in jail for gathering and meeting and worshiping. Uh, certain parts in the in the Middle East, uh, it is illegal for Christians to gather corporately and worship. Uh, and so let me just say this, for all the issues and the flaws that the United States of America has, I do thank God that we live in a place, in a country, where we, can, we, we do have the freedom to assemble and to worship God as we choose and to freely worship. Um, that, yeah, our country has a lot of flaws. We got a lot of issues. We have a lot of stuff wrong. But I do thank God that we live in a place where we are able to physically worship God in the way that we choose to. Right, let me just say this. Well, let's not take that liberty and ability for granted. However, throughout history, there have been periods where the church has been faced with unprecedented obstacles and challenges. Many of those periods in history came through persecution. In Acts 8, the early church faced a period of persecution at the hands of then Saul, who was not yet Paul. He was going around killing Christians. So 
Listen, if we have to forsake having church physically and meet virtually for a couple of weeks, that's a, a small thing compared to the stuff the early church had to go through. Um, the early church experienced people busting in their house, arresting them, carrying them off to jail, and in many cases, killing them be simply because of the faith that they chose to follow in believing in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so uh, the Bible says that our light affliction, what is, which works in us, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it works in us a more exceeding weight of glory. And when, when we look at the broader scheme of things, the stuff that we're dealing with right now is really a light affliction. Having to be in the house with your kids and your family where you're able to be warm and safe and cook on your own stove, that's a light affliction. Not being able to go to the movies, not being able to go to the gym. Listen, y'all, I'm struggling with this gym thing. Y'all, those who know me know I am really struggling with this thing of not being able to go to the gym. That is my other sanctuary. That is my place of refuge. So I'm struggling with that a little bit. But the Bible says that the light afflictions that we, are, that we deal with are but for a moment. And so the first thing that we have to understand is this moment that we find ourselves in in history, this season that we find ourselves in, it's a light affliction. It, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's a light affliction. Uh, being, having to stay in the house for a season for a little bit of time, it's a small price to pay uh, given what the church has had to go through historically, given the sacrifices that have been made throughout history by believers and particularly by black folk in this country. So if you have to stay in the house, if you have to... Uh, take a work from home if your kids are away from school that's a light affliction it's a small price to pay and when we look at what the early church experienced and what the early church went through we have to keep in mind that everything we are experiencing everything that we are going through right now is a light affliction it's a small price to pay compared to the generations who have gone before us who endured far more than we are enduring right now who endured many things so that we could enjoy the kind of quality of life that we have right now and so the stuff that we're dealing with it is a light affliction yes there are concerns yes there are worries and yes there are inconveniences folks may have trips canceled uh travel plans may be disrupted and interrupted work schedules are, are getting inter disrupted uh you know different things are happening some of us may deal with financial challenges but again in the broader scheme of things these are some light afflictions because most of what we lose in this moment can be regained, most of it. I, I know that there may be some things that can't, but most of what we experience in this season, it is able to be regained. You can get it back. Uh, and I know that there's some of you who are saying, well, I was supposed to go to a wedding on this day and we're supposed to have this event on this day. Uh, listen, uh, uh, if, you, if, if, if we believe God, that God is faithful and God is just, there is an opportunity to recapture the moment that you, you have right now. There's an opportunity to reschedule stuff. Thank God that you will have the health and the strength to reschedule whatever you need to reschedule. But one of the things that I want us to see tonight is that in Acts 8, now my, my prayer partner, Pastor Sean Marshall, is on, and we actually prayed, and he mentioned this scripture earlier, and it, and, it, and it just exploded in my spirit. And he talked about, we talked about Acts 8, because in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says that when the church was persecuted, the church was scattered. But watch this, something powerful happened when the church scattered. The Bible says, that when the church scattered, they didn't cry, they didn't complain, they didn't wail, they didn't get upset. When the church scattered, Acts 8 verse 4 says, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Um, listen, y'all, when the church scattered, the Bible says they went everywhere. Let me say that one more time. When the church scattered, the Bible says they went everywhere. So when they went everywhere, when they went everywhere, they went with the word of God already in them. Let me just say this, people of God, we have an opportunity to take the church everywhere. The Bible says in Acts 2, matter of fact, Acts 2, um, verse 46 says, They continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor, pay, pay, favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Listen. Uh, the season where the early church gathered from house to house, the season where the early church experienced a level of persecution was a season where the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
Y'all, what would it look like if we as the body of Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ, begin to pray, God, do that again in this season. God, allow us to use this season to see souls added to the church daily. God, allow us to use this season for us to preach the gospel everywhere. God, allow us to use this season to carry your word and your presence every place that we are and we go where we don't just see the church as a building, but we see the church as a people who are scattered to carry the word of God and to carry the gospel to bring good news to those who need it the most. Uh, Y'all, listen, there are people in our country right now who are afraid. There are people who are vulnerable. There are people who are fearful. There are people who are struggling. There are people who are in pain. They don't know how this thing is going to end up. And and there are some people who don't have the kind of faith that we have, so they don't necessarily have an anchor. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, this hope we have as an anchor of our souls. Listen, y'all, one of the things about an anchor is an anchor stabilizes you. And if you don't have anything to stabilize, you, you can go to and fro, you can be rocked from side to side, but in seasons and times like this, when you have an anchor, you can hold steady, you can hold steadfast, you can be unmovable. That's why the Bible says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Listen, the work of the Lord is not is not uh, is not predicated upon us having a keyboard player or an organist right there. And and the worship team is singing. The work of the Lord is not bound to one particular location. The work of the Lord can happen anywhere and everywhere. You can encounter the presence of God in your living room. You can encounter the presence of God in your bedroom. You can encounter the presence of God in your kitchen. And I'm not saying that the physical assembly of the church is not important because I believe it is. I believe we are a body and I do believe believe that God desires for his body to come together and connect. So I'm not saying that. And I know we're already in a day and time and I'm cautious when I say these things because we already live in a day and time where many people question, why do I need to go to church? Why do I need to physically go to church? I can meet God at home. Yes, you can meet God at home, but you need other believers. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 that the gifts, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers were giving Ephesians 4 11 for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Listen, you need other people to help perfect affect you. You need other people to help sharpen you. You need other people to help push you to be your best. You need other people to make you who to help you become who God ultimately called you to be. But if you are in a moment where you're not able to physically get around those other people, take what God has already taught you. Take what God has already given you. Take what God has already imparted to you and use that to glorify God. And I want all of us to begin to ask the question, If I have to be quarantined, if my travel is disrupted, if my plans get interrupted, if I can't do what I thought I was supposed to be doing in this season, what would it look like for me to glorify God in the season I'm in? What would it look like for me to glorify God with the challenges that I have? What would it look like for me to glorify God with the moment that I'm standing in right now? Because listen, y'all, every moment in time is pregnant with possibility. Every moment in time is pregnant with potential. I don't care what what moment you find yourself in in. I don't care what season you find yourself in. At the end of the day, there's opportunity. At the end of the day, there's potential. There are ways in which God can move, that God can get glory. There are ways in which God can show himself strong on your behalf. So listen, what does it look like for God to get glory out of your life in this season? What does it look like for God to use you in a special and a significant way in the hour we find ourselves in. So this is not the hour to be timid or fearful or afraid. This is the hour for us to get creative, y'all. Listen, in this hour, if we're scattered, get creative. In this hour, if we're scattered, a pull on the wisdom of God. Uh, listen, y'all, the, the, the church in Acts 8 was scattered. The, so the Bible says they were scattered. They had to go all over. But here's the other thing that happened. When the church is scattered, the Bible says they preach the word of God everywhere. Then this, the next thing that happens, verse 5 talks about how Philip went down to Samaria and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. But something else happened when he went down and preached the gospel. The Bible says that when he went to Samaria and he preached the gospel, big brother, love you, man. Uh, The Bible says that when he went to Samaria and he preached the gospel, something else happened. Signs and wonders were done. 
Miracles begin to happen. The Bible says that unclean spirits begin to come out. People who were paralyzed uh, and, and lame, they couldn't walk. They were healed. Sick people got healed. De- folk that are, were battling, that were bound by demons get, had, were, were freed and delivered. Because, watch this, because the church got scattered. Because the church had to move from their regular routine. Because the church had a disruption in their routine plan. Listen, y'all, I believe God is part, if I believe part of the reason that God is a allow the disruption in this moment is because for so long we've taken our ability to gather for granted. We've taken the presence of God for granted. We've taken worship for granted. We've taken the potential that happens when we come together for granted. And so God allows the disruption sometime because sometime we need a reset. Sometime we need to pull back. Sometime we need to unplug. Sometime we need to recalibrate. Sometime we need to, you know, kind of just reconfigure things. Our thinking has to be reconfigured. Our approach has to be reconfigured. Uh, as believers and followers of Jesus, we got to rethink how we do church. We got to rethink how we reach people. We got to rethink what does it mean to impact lives because reaching people cannot be only predicated upon a Sunday morning gathering. We can't only reach people on Sunday morning because what happens the other six days of the week? Are we saying Jesus saves only on Sunday or can Jesus save money through Saturday too? Are we saying God only heals on Sunday or are we saying that God can heal Monday through Saturday too? Are we saying God can only cast demons out on Sunday or are we saying that God can cast out demons Monday through Saturday too? What are we saying about God? What are we saying about the presence of God, the power of God, and God's ability to move, heal, deliver, and touch and change lives from Monday through Saturday? So we cannot only be predicated. God's presence is not predicated only upon a Sunday morning gathering. We have to have the ability to be creative. We have to have the ability to be flexible, and we have to have the ability to be, be innovative, right? Being innovative means that we do things in more than one way. Being innovative means that we don't get stuck in a rut. You know, the reality is that for most of us, for most of us, the model of church that we have right now is a model that has existed for the last 40 or 50 years. So what God is saying in this season is this is the time for new models. Uh, My spiritual mother, um, me and Pastor Sean were praying about this earlier and we were talking about this. In 2005, she she prophesied and she gave us a word and she said what you've seen as a model, but what God is doing in this next season, this is almost 15 years ago that she gave this word to us. Uh, She said uh, what you've seen as a model and what you know, that's what you that's all you know, because that's all you've seen. But for what God is doing and what God is about to do, three things she said is new. It's different and you haven't seen it. And so I am even stretched right now and I'm even challenged right now praying into this thing of what does this model mean? What does this model look like? How do we envision a future with new models? I'm not saying that we throw away Sunday mornings. Listen, y'all know I'm a church boy. I love church, right? I love preaching. I love to shout all that kind of stuff. But what I am saying is also We have to expand our model beyond just Sunday morning and we have to envision what does the kingdom of God look like from Monday through Saturday? What does it look like to live out our faith in the workplace? What does it mean to live out our faith in our communities? What does it mean to live out our faith among family, among friends? What does it look like to live out our faith among people who may not believe what you believe and may not agree with you? And so the Bible says that when the church scattered, something powerful happened. The gospel was preached everywhere. Miracles, signs and wonders began to happen. Sick people were healed. Those who were paralyzed and lame and couldn't walk, they got healed. Those who were bound by demons, the devils were cast out. Listen, y'all, my prayer and what I'm asking and believing God for in this season is that in the midst of crisis, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of everything that's going on in the world right now, that God would use this moment to bring the church back to a place where we see miracles, signs and wonders. Listen, what would it look like for God to use you to heal somebody in your neighborhood? I'm not talking about, let me bring my neighbor to church. No, I'm talking about you pray for somebody on your street corner and God heals them on the spot. What would it look like uh, for you to get someone delivered uh, that that person you know is crazy and you know is bound by demons, that you don't even have to wait to get them in church, but they can get set free right there. What would it look like for the church to be scattered, to go everywhere, to carry the power of God everywhere, to be used of God in multiple places and spaces? And then when we come together, It's not just so that we can all 
uh, just get 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 free. But when we come together, it is so that we can get refilled so that we can be sent back out to do what God has equipped and called us to do. And so we have to revisit this thing. We have to revisit the models that we have. We have to revisit what does it mean to be the church? What does it mean for God to raise us up? What does it mean for God to use us? How is God equipping us to function and operate in this season? How is God going to get glory in our lives? Because y'all listen, in Acts 8, when the church was scattered, that's when they saw the power of God really come together. Because let me just say this. When the church is not scattered, one of the things that can happen is that we can become incestuous and toxic because part of the reason that many churches are unhealthy, part of the reason that some churches are toxic, and part of the reason that some churches are dysfunctional is because we are too internally focused. And when you don't focus on the world and God's mission to change and save the world, to deliver and to set free, you begin to focus on each other too much. And so what do I mean by that? So if you don't go cast out demons out there, you're going to only look for demons in here. <laughs> Let me say it one more time. If you don't allow God to use you to cast out demons out there, you're going to keep looking for all the demons in here. And then you're going to begin to think, well, that's got to be a demon there. That's got to be a demon there. No, listen, the real enemy is Satan. The real mission field is the world. And God wants to use us to take all this power, to take the anointing of the Holy Ghost and all of these things and impact the world for his glory. Not just impact each other, but to impact the world. So my question is, what is God giving you that you can take everywhere? What has God imparted in your life that you can take everywhere? What has God equipped you with that you can take everywhere? Because listen, whatever God has given you has to be portable. Let me say that one more time. Whatever God has given you, it's got to be portable. The, the anointing, the equipping, the gifting that God has given you, it has to be portable. It can't only work on Sundays in a sanctuary. Because if you got a real anointing, your anointing should work in a hospital room as well as it does in a sanctuary. If you're really an evangelist and you call as an evangelist, then that means you don't just preach the gospel to those who are already saved. But if you're called as an evangelist, you go out and preach to those who are lost and who don't know Jesus. If you're anointed with a gift of healing, uh, you should be able to pray for a sick person in their house, in a hospital, wherever they at. You shouldn't just be able to pray for a sick person at an altar when it's a, a, when when it's a keyboard or an organ playing spiritual music behind you and, and the worship team is singing, he's singing healing is here. No, no. If you got an, an, an anointing and a gift of healing, you should be able to use that gift anywhere. Uh, if you if you got an anointing to call out spirits and to cast out devils, then you should be able to call them out and cast them out anywhere that you find them. If you are called to be an intercessor, you don't need a microphone in a sanctuary. You should be able to intercede in your house, you should be able to intercede on a street corner. You should be able to intercede in a grocery store if that's what God has called you to do. If you are called and equipped and gifted by God uh, with all these different gifts, talents, abilities, uh, uh, if you got a gift of discernment, your discernment ain't just to discern people in the sanctuary and try to be in people's business and, and you only want the gift of the prophetic to be nosy. Your gift of discernment ain't to discern who in the church is sleeping with who and who lying and who this and who that. No, no. Your gift of discernment should work on your job. Your gift of discernment should work in the store. Your gift of discernment should work in the neighborhood. It should work wherever you are. It should work in the mall wherever you go. And so when the church is scattered, that's when we need the gifts. We don't see the, the main place we need the gifts is not just on Sunday morning. We need the gifts to operate when we're scattered uh, because that's when the power of God is really able to be demonstrated. Here's the other thing that happened. The Bible says in verse seven of Acts eight, unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Listen, the city rejoiced. Y'all listen. When is the last time a city rejoiced because the power of God showed up? I've not seen it, but the Bible says there was great joy in that city. What would it look like for God to use God's people so much and for the people of God to be so powerful, for the people of God to be so anointed, for the people of God to be scattered and using their gifts so much so that the entire city rejoices? Okay. okay. Listen, y'all, could you imagine the people of God having so much of an anointing to heal the sick, 
that the saints of God go and clear out a whole cancer ward where people who have stage four cancers and who are in ICU, who are on life support, who are on ventilators, where the people of God pray and all of a sudden entire wards of a hospital get cleared out because they all get healed and they walk up out of there. That's when a city rejoices. Listen. <sighs> okay, y'all, listen. That's when a city rejoices. A city doesn't rejoice when a church builds a big old building and, and you build a 50 and $40 million building. That's wonderful. That's cute. That's great. But that's not when a city rejoices. A city will rejoice when signs and wonders happen. A city will rejoice when people's lives are touched and changed. Not when you build a big edifice and a monument to yourself. Not when a church builds a big old sanctuary with a steeple. There's nothing wrong with buildings. I'm not anti, I'm not against buildings. But at the end of the day, God gets more glory out of lives being changed than God gets out of a, bu out of a beautiful building being built. Because at the end of the day, that building could be full of people whose souls are empty. God gets more glory out of a out of a people who are filled than he does out of a building who are filled. God is more concerned with your spirit being filled than he is with a building being filled. And I, and I listen again, I love beautiful church. Listen, y'all know I'm a church boy and I love, I love nice church buildings. I love beautiful buildings. I love beautiful sanctuaries. I love all that. But what I love more than beautiful buildings with, with nice sound systems and all of that, what I love more than that is seeing God's people set free. What I love more than that is seeing God get glory and the name of Jesus being exalted. That's what I love more than that. So y'all listen, what I want to say is when the church is scattered, that's when God has the opportunity to do those kind of things. So let's not look at this moment that we're in as, an, as, as just the end of the world. It is an opportunity for God to use the church wherever we are, wherever we go, that, we're, that God can raise us up and anoint us and use us in many different ways. And the Bible says, watch this, in Acts 8 verse 9, after the city rejoices, the Bible says in verse 9, there was a certain man called Simon who had previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. And, and the Bible says in verse um, 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. Verse 13, then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and he was amazed at the miracles, signs and wonders. Listen, y'all, there are some people that when they get saved, when God changes their life, it's going to get the attention of a whole lot of people because Simon, the sorcerer in Acts 8, he was renowned in that city. People looked at him and they called him the great power of God. He was a sorcerer. In other words, he was operating in witchcraft. He was a sorcerer. He operated in witchcraft. He operated in power, but he didn't get his power from God. And we are living in a day and time where there are a lot of people who operate in sorcery and who operate in power, who operate in witchcraft, and they're operating in some powers that are not from God. And so, the, but the Bible says that if you can get a Simon the sorcerer saved, the whole city is going to marvel at that. Listen, what if some witches got saved in this season? What if some warlocks got saved in this season? What if some people who are bound in divination got saved in this season? What would it look like if some people who you know the enemy is using mightily got saved in this season? Listen, think of the most wicked person you know, the most hateful, evil, despicable, vile person that you know. What if that person got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and God began to use them? What impact and what difference would that make in the world around you and around them if that person gave their life to Jesus? That's what happened in Samaria. The Bible says that Simon the sorcerer, he had been practicing witchcraft. He had deceived the city. He, they, they were calling him the great power of God. He was operating in the dark arts. But the Bible says that when he got saved, when he gave his life to Jesus, there was something that shifted in that city, y'all. Listen, this is the season where God is coming after some Simon the sorcerers. This is the season where God is coming after some people because there are some people who God has a worn out for their arrest in the spirit. There are some people whose lives God wants to reach and touch in this season. There are some people who that maybe even the church has written off and said there's no hope for them. There are some people who have been written off and been dismissed because people think there's no hope for them and they're, far, they're too far gone and they're just nuts. They're crazy. They're this and they're that. But those are the very ones that God wants to save. Those those are the very ones that God wants to deliver. Those are the very ones that God wants to heal. What would it look like in this season for God to deliver some of those people? But listen, y'all. Let me just say this. 
if the church had not been scattered in verses 1 through 3 of Acts 8, Philip would have never gone down to Samaria. If Philip had never gone down to Samaria, he would not have preached the gospel and healed the sick and cast out demons in Samaria. If he had not healed the sick, cast out demons and preached the gospel in Samaria, Simon the sorcerer would have never taken notice. And if Simon had never taken notice, Simon would never have gotten saved. So a whole city and multiple cities were changed, transformed and set free because the church was scattered. Because they had to move out of their comfort zone. And let me just say this. I'm going to be prophetic for a minute. Uh, this is a season because what, what we have to understand about the moment that we're in is that this moment did not catch God by surprise. The Lord did, was not caught off guard two months ago when the coronavirus began to spread around the world. The Lord wasn't caught off guard and shocked at what began to happen a couple of months ago. The Lord knew this moment was coming. And what I love about God is because the Lord knew this moment was coming, the Lord had already made provision for this moment. I shared last night uh, in a live that what, what, what to do in a storm. And the first thing I said that we have to do in a storm is that we have to be able to go back to what God said to us before the storm came. Listen, y'all, sometimes God gives us certain instructions because he knows what's ahead. See, sometimes we think, you know, here's, here's, okay, here's how the enemy messes with us. God speaks to us. God gives us a promise. God gives us instructions. But then a storm comes, a crisis comes up, something happens, and whatever happens, it causes us to doubt what God had just told us. And then we, we begin to throw away what God told us because of what we're facing in our present moment. But what we have to realize is God knew about the moment you were going into before you went into it. So sometime God will tell you what he tells you on the front end because he knows what you're about to face in the next space of time and in the next season. And so you got to hold on to what God spoke before to help you to get deal with the moment that you're facing right now. Because what God told you before is going to help you get through this moment. So, so what God told you is not coming to doubt because of the moment, but what God told you is going to help you get through the moment. And so, so what we have to do in this season, in this moment, in this hour is go back to say, God, what are you doing? What have you spoken? And what are you showing us in this season? And how do we navigate? How do we maneuver in this, in this season? Uh, because at the end of the day, we're living in a world where things are changing. Matter of fact, the old folk used to sing a song that said, time is filled with swift trans transition. Not on earth and move can stand. Uh, build your hopes on, on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. And at the end of the day, we, we have to understand that the only constant in life is change. And yes, time is filled with transition. There's a whole lot of transition happening. There are changes happening by the day. And we have to be able to be fluid enough and resilient enough to say, I'm going to hold on to God in the middle of whatever changes are happening. Because if I hold on to God, God is going to help me land in the right spot because he knows where the storm is going to end. He knows how to get navigate through what we're in right now. And if I, if I trust in God, then God will put me where I need to be in the right moment in time. And so we have to get out of this mindset that says, oh, you know, I don't know what's happening. Oh, you know, all we can do is pray because I just don't know. You don't have to know. But if you would, if you would tap into the presence of the one who already knows, God knows the, the Bible says he knows the end from the beginning. So God knew about every situation you face, whether it's this coronavirus, whether it's a financial crisis you face, whether it's a relationship crisis, whatever situation you find yourself in right now, God knew about the situation before it came about but what and the other great thing about God is not only had he known about the situation before it came about God had made provision for the situation before it came about God already had made a plan God had a plan all in mind God had a strategy in mind and all God was waiting on you to do is listen for his voice and his answer to get through this moment so listen this is a great season for us and I know that there's a lot of challenges that we face but this is the season to recalibrate to reconfigure, to reimagine, to re to um to dream again. This is the season for us to say, well, God, what is possible in this moment? What is possible in this hour? Uh, you know, there's there's a, there's a whole lot of dire forecast about what's going to happen economically and fortunes are going to be lost. But one thing that I've learned is that anytime there's a depression or a recession, new new wealth is created afterwards and new new millionaires are made. And so there's some of us that God is going to give you. And listen, hear me in the spirit, because there's some of you.
you that in a season of economic uncertainty, that God is going to give you ideas and strategy that's going to help position you that when the economy begins to come back up, you're going to be positioned to create wealth and to see new wealth because the idea God gives you during the economic downturn will be used to help you come back up. Listen, I said this in the very beginning. Crisis either causes people to step up or to snap off. And right now you got a choice and you better ask yourself the question, am I going to snap off or am I going to step up? Because in this season, God is giving us a choice. Which of the two are you going to do? Are you going to be one who snaps off or are you going to be one who steps up? Because in this moment, in this season, in this hour, that's going to be what has to happen. And you have to choose that I'm going to be one of the ones who steps up. I'm going to be one of the ones who listens real close to hear what God is saying and see what God is doing so that when things begin to move forward, I'm going to be positioned in the right way and in the right space. And I'm going to be positioned and prepared for this next now moment. That's it, y'all. That's it. That's all. We got to be prepared. We got to be discerning. We got to be wise. And we've got to know that in the middle of any crisis we face, God has already made provision for it. God has already given us the strategy around it. And the Bible says, because he knows the end from the beginning, he can tell you about the end and he can give you a strategy and insight to get to the end while you're still in the middle. So listen, y'all, that's all I've got right now. Uh, I'm going to be coming on some more uh, to kind of uh, just impart as the Lord begins to deal with me and give me things and give me some revelation and downloads from heaven and give me insight. But listen, let me just say this again. Um, the things that we're dealing with right now are just a light affliction. The price you may pay in being inconvenienced in this moment is a light affliction. It's not, it's not going to destroy you. Um, the church is more resilient than you think. And I know some people are, well, what if we can't meet or what if we can't this and that? Listen, in Acts 8, what did he say? That the church was scattered. And when the church was scattered, they preached the gospel everywhere. When the church was scattered, that's when miracles, signs, and wonders began to happen. When the church was scattered, that's when souls were won to Christ. There, th we are in a great moment of opportunity for the kingdom of God because right now the world around us is afraid. But we have a, a solution. We have the answer. Jesus is still the answer. Whether he's the answer in a sanctuary or whether he's the answer on a street corner, he's still the answer. And as the church, we have to be prepared and positioned to offer the answer to people even outside of the building. We have to be prepared to even offer the answer to people even if it's not in our regular environment and routine. So let me just say to y'all, listen, God knows the end from the beginning. He knew where we would find ourselves. And this is a light affliction. Let's make sure that we understand this light affliction is, affliction is temporary. And on the other side of it, we have to be positioned and prepared to, to find the new models that God is releasing, to understand the new pathways God is creating. Because whenever there is a changing of seasons, whenever there is a changing of models, God is getting ready to show up in a whole different way. So listen, y'all. Um, listen. Um, as the body of Christ, let's not wring our hands and feel like we're in defeat. Let's not, you know, uh, let's not pull our hair out. Um, this is not the first time that the church has had to figure out how to navigate. This is not the first time we've had to figure out how to deal with a present challenge. But what we have to do in this season is say, God, what are you saying? What are you doing? How do we respond? Because God is bigger than a Sunday morning experience. God is bigger than a building. God can give you ideas, insights, uh, wisdom, and revelation that will carry you Monday through Saturday, not only on Sunday morning. So that's it, y'all. That's all I want to say, that the church is going mobile. And this is the season for God to impart gifts in your life, anointings, abilities, and graces in your life that you are to carry everywhere. Acts 3, I'm sorry, Acts 8, verse 4. Therefore, those who are scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. Listen, it's time for the church to get out of the salt shaker. You know, one of the things about this, the Bible says um, that we are, the, we, are, we are salt. The Bible compares us as the believers and followers of Jesus to salt. But one of the things about salt is salt does not do you any good as long as it's in the salt shaker. 
Nobody uh, looks at salt in a salt shaker and talks about how wonderful it tastes. The only way you can taste the salt is to get the salt out of the salt shaker. The only way that you can benefit from seasoning your food with salt is to get the salt out of the salt shaker and onto the meat. And what God is doing in this season is he's shaken the salt shaker called the church and he's shaken some granules of salt out of the salt shaker because the world needs our flavor. The world needs some seasoning. The world needs the flavor of the body of Christ. The world needs the flavor of the kingdom of God. So what God is doing is he's shaking up the salt shaker and saying, I need you to go flavor some stuff. I need you to go add a little salt to this meat because it needs some seasoning right now. And so what are the places that God is putting you in that need the flavor of the kingdom? What are the spaces that God is going to have you in that need your flavor? Because God has given you a unique flavor. Take that salt and apply it. And I promise you, things will taste different on the end of it. I love you all. Listen, this is Pastor Q. If you're not following us, follow us here on Facebook at New Hope Covenant Church Chicago. Follow us on Instagram at New Hope Chicago. Um, if those of you who want to sow or give online, you can go to our website at nhccc.org, nhccc3cs.org. You can also go to the app Givelify if you want to sow at New Hope Covenant Church, uh, New Hope Covenant Church on Givelify. Listen, I bless God for you all. Hope Nation, I love y'all. Um, stay tuned for some updates per, com, uh, concerning Sunday and how we're going to be moving forward in this season. I, I will give you all updates. Um, as we are kind of mapping out some strategy and how we're going to move forward. So I love y'all. I'm praying for y'all. Um, and y'all pray for me. Listen, uh, we're still in this thing together. Even if I'm not physically in your presence, we will get this thing. We will get through this thing together. We're still one body. We're still united. We're still connected. All right. And listen, rivers are still flowing. Dams are still breaking. And doors are still opening. This is still Hope Nation. And we're going to trust God in the middle of the chaos and storm that we're in right now. All right. So stay tuned. Uh, keep watching our social media for updates. We'll send out communications via email and social media. Make sure everyone gets the word. I love y'all. Y'all pray for our nation. Pray for our church. And I'll see y'all next time. God bless you all.